on this because I'm not only not in this room, I'm usually in the room in the business division, but I can do this. I can draw. So that's actually useful. So I'll probably be doing that at some point when I talk about designs and sketching out wireframes and, and so on down the line. All right. What I want to do today is I want to finally cover the boring chapter, all right, about formatting text. So you can tell how much I like that chapter because I've procrastinated it for three classes at least, maybe two classes, all right. And again, it's not a matter of me not liking it. It's a matter of, you can read it in the book, I don't have anything much to add to it. I just want to hit the highlights and, and give my spin on it. Um, let's see. I want to review the stuff that we had talked about with CSS. I want to talk about the use of, so let me put a list up here. Here's our list for today. Review CSS, HTML, previous four classes worth. I guess that's almost implied, right? What we do in this class always builds on what we did before. So if I make a new web page today, all right, of course I'm going to go over the stuff that we went over in those four classes. So I almost don't even need to say that. Um, I want to... Again, we're going to continue to look at other uses for CSS. We will probably do this um, in every class as well. In other words, we might do something, you know, in the first uh, examples of CSS, we focus mainly on changing the color of stuff. All right? So we, ex we explored changing the font of stuff. We're going to explore things just as the mood strikes me about borders and padding and margins and all that sort of thing. So just when it seems to make sense in a lecture, I'll drop some of these new techniques in. I will specifically talk about some CSS stuff for layout in a series of lectures, but I'll just sort of drop these things in. Um, just as an illustration of once you have the basic concepts down of CSS, you can pretty much do anything what you want with it, anything that you might want with it. We will talk about other folders, that is putting stuff in other folders, um, like images, CSS files, and so on. We'll talk about our friend text formatting. We will talk about image a little bit more. Specifically, we'll talk about images for backgrounds. And then we may today, depending on how fast we go, and how much of my voice I keep, we may get into the project. So what I would suggest for next time, for next class on Thursday, if you have not already gone through and read the stuff on Canvas about the project, do that for next Thursday. All right? If you have, look at it again just to review and refresh your memory. All right, so Thursday we will probably talk about that. We may talk about that near the end of class today. So at any rate, this is sort of our roadmap for today. I'm going to review CSS stuff and HTML in the previous five classes. So we're going to start with a brand new web page, make it from scratch. We're going to hit on other uses for CSS other than the stuff that we've gone over talk about putting stuff in other folders, talk about text formatting, talk about using images as backgrounds,
and then talk about the project. So depending on how it goes, we'll, we'll cover these items today. So let me start out by making a brand new web page. All right. So I don't have much imagination today, so we'll pretend we're making an online diary where I talk about my innermost feeling. No, we're not going to do that. All right. But we'll, we'll, we'll do it like a journal, all right, you know, where I give a date and, and I talk about, you know, today I lost my voice in class or whatever. All right, so we'll do that. And we'll use that as sort of... Um, a basis to cover all these different themes. All right, so let me start out and let me make a basic HTML page. So I'm going to go into Notepad or Notepad++ if you would prefer or any text editor if you are not running Windows, if you're running, if you're running, uh, if you're running a Mac or, or really even a Linux machine, as long as you have a plain old text editor, that's fine. All right, and I'm going to make a web page. So I'm going to fly through this pretty quick. So if you have any questions, let me know. This all should be review. Doc type at the top. Gives the browser about information about what it's going to be dealing with, what the contents of this file means. This means it's dealing with an HTML document. And my main HTML tag and a ending HTML tag. All right. I notice a lot that people tend to forget, some people tend to forget the end body and end HTML tag. My guess is, is because they do this. They put the HTML in there. All right, well, let me put the head in here. I'm done with the head section. Let me get into the body section. All right. I'm going to put a whole bunch of stuff in here. Wow. Boy, the hour and a half in lab goes by fast. I'm done. Save. Turn in. All right. And again, in that case, they're missing the end body and end head tag. All right. That's why I strongly suggest when you create a tag, as soon as you create the starting tag, put the ending tag in. Leave yourself a little bit extra space, put the ending tag in. Then you never forget to go and do it because you've done it, you know. Um, you know, no time like the present. So, this sort of is the shell of your web page. Your web page will, at the very least, have this and plus a little bit more content. It's going to have a doc type. It's going to have an HTML tag starting and ending that wraps around everything. It is going to have a head section and a body section. The head and body section do not overlap at all. There's the head, then there's the body. Anything that's going to appear on the page belongs in the body. The title simply appears on the title bar. So if I want a top level heading that says, you know, my diary, I would not put it in the head section. I would put it in the body section. Alright, and I'm going to make an article, 
boy, this will be fun. I can start this today and I can add to it every day for the whole class. And when you're done, I'll have a little mini novel that maybe I can publish. Probably not. So there's my article. And what's the date? June 23rd? You know it's funny? I shouldn't tell you this because it makes me sound lazy. But over the summer, I teach... I, I, I'm on campus. I, I teach on campus only two days a week. I only have the Tuesday class. and Sometimes I have two classes on Tuesday. This summer I only have one class on Tuesday. So I'm only working two days a week. Which means that I have every week a four-day weekend. Friday, Saturday, Sunday, Monday. Then I work Tuesday. Then I get a day off. <laughs> and then I work Thursday. Pretty sweet schedule, right? So what happens every summer, of course? Every summer there's the 4th of July. And this year the 4th of July is what day of the week? Saturday. And it's like, I feel like I've been cheated out of a holiday because it's not on one of the days that I have to work. It's like, darn it. I don't get the 4th, you know, I don't get the 4th of July off because I was already off for that day. I'll tell you, that is, that's sad. But every summer that that happens, that thought process goes through my head. Like, man, I don't get the fourth off this year. It's like, well, you weren't working anyhow, but anyhow, I digress. So, one thing I didn't do with this, which probably pays to do, and especially since I, uh, since I found out this new little writing thing, little drawing thing, is I didn't design this page yet. Whoops. Oh, geez, now I really messed up. There we go. I'll draw on this. There we go. This wasn't a good idea. All right. What I meant to show is my page is going to look like this. I'm going to have my headline at the top that says my diary. Then each little entry is going to be an article of its own. It's going to have a headline and then probably a paragraph about it. And then I'll repeat that as noted. Now again, this isn't a particularly complicated design. But nonetheless, it's a design. All right? So that's what I'm going to create in here. Top level heading. Each day is going to be represented by an article. That makes sense, right? An, an entry. Um, and each article is going to start off with an H1, indicating the, the main header for that article. Then I could have some subheaders if I wanted to. So, for example, if I'm doing several things today, I could have um, the heading about the class. I could have a heading about, I actually do a radio show on WOBC, Oberlin College's radio station. So I could put a heading for that. And then whatever else I'm going to do tonight, probably eat pizza and, and watch Modern Family. All right, so I could have like three different sections for what I did during my morning, what I'm doing under my afternoon, what I'm going to do in my evening. All right, I could do that, three different headings with paragraphs underneath it and all that. Now, I made these articles because that made sense to me. You could also use section here, right? And I could use a section tag in, uh, in place of an article tag. And you could come up with an explanation of why you would prefer one versus the other. You know what? It's not worth arguing about. It's a, it's a portion of the page. And whether you call that portion a section or an article really doesn't matter that much. All right? To me. All right? It probably is good to wrap those in something. In other words, whether it be an article or a section tag, instead of just having a bunch of headers and, and paragraphs. So create an article or a section for each day, in this case, uh, like a diary. 
but whether you call those or whether you use the article tag or the section tag really is largely a moot point. Okay, so I have H1 here, and then I'll write a paragraph about this. Okay, so we'll just do this as it is, all right? We could write as much as we wanted to. There is a tool that I hesitate to mention to class, or not a tool, but a device called Greek text. Any of you familiar with Greek text? It's not really Greek, it's like a placeholder text. Lorem ipsum, blah, 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 blah. What you can do is, if you're mocking up, for example, if, if I was developing a website for a client and I did not know what the text would actually be on the page, I could put a block of just like placeholder text, dummy text, all right? There's actually a website that you can go to that will generate this random text for you. And then you can copy and paste it on your page. So it's called Greek text. Lorem ipsum. And again, here's, a, here's an explanation about it. Lorem ipsum is simply dummy text of the printing and typesending industry, blah, 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 blah. Ever since the 1500s. Wow, that's a long tradition. But I could generate a paragraph, let's say of this, or two paragraphs or whatever. And I can then go and copy that paragraph. into my page. All right. I'm going to save this. So I click save. Change it to all files. Probably should change that to UTF-8. And I'm going to call this diary dot HTML. Save. Now I can minimize this and I can view this page in the browser. And you see how that placeholder text sits in there. Now, I've, I, I've had students this term ask me, can we use that on our assignments? And the answer is no. All right? Part of this class, even though this isn't a writing class per se, part of this class is understanding like what an appropriate amount of content is for a web page, what appropriate language to use on a web page is, you know, how to design the content in a way. So therefore, using this placeholder text isn't a good idea. Now, for your design, for your project, you're welcome to use it because that's just sort of a mock-up just to show me where your thoughts are. And if you're developing something and you don't want to think about writing the paragraph right away, you can use it. But again, don't turn in a final page with this code in here. All right? Okay, so anyhow, here's what we get. Now, by default, remember the browser displays things according to its rules. The H1 is the biggest thing on the page. The H1 on the, within the article is slightly smaller, notice. We, we made that observation the other day. And then each paragraph is that. The default colors are a white background and black print. The default um, font is probably Times New Roman, but it's a serif font. All right. 
Any questions? Here's my code. One file. Here's that same file viewed within the browser. Now one thing I suggest is building your web page um, by doing the CSS and the HTML sort of together. All right. In other words, I'm not going to develop my entire web page and then go in and throw in some, some HTML, or some CSS rather. I'm going to develop my CSS as I'm developing the HTML. All right. So, um, now that we have the start of the HTML done, let's develop some CSS. And I'm going to start out by doing some of the basic stuff that we did last time, and then I'm going to going to add to it. So let me open up Notepad again. I'm going to put this in a separate file. All right, I'm going to put my CSS in a separate file. Now, why do we do that? Modularity. All right. Um, does anyone care to expand on that? That is correct. We're making little modules, but what's the advantage of doing that? Easier to update. All right. Yes. You could reference it from other sheets. Exactly. All those things are different ways of saying the same thing. That is, by separating my HTML and CSS, I can change one without affecting the other. So, I could create my diary. Maybe I have a page for every month, for example. So that would be 12 pages a year. All right? And then, you know, if I keep it for several years, I might get 40, 50 pages. All right, in my diary. All right. If the CSS was on every one of those pages, if I wanted to change the look of my page, of my site, I would have to go in and change the CSS on every one of those pages. Well, that's very tedious. It's prone to error. And there's better things for me to do with my time than that. If I put the CSS in a separate file, if I decide, gee, Green is no longer my favorite color. Red is. I can make all my pages red in an instant, simply by changing the single CSS file. So I'm going to go start off, and I'm just going to put some basic things in here. I'm going to say body background. Again, we could use just the basic colors like red or green or whatever, but since we we're reviewing, I'm going to go in and access a color scheme generator. And, I don't know, since this is summer, Let's go for a nice, actually, let's go for, I don't know, a reddish color for that. fine-tuning it. I'm making, I'm upping the saturation. That makes it a deeper color. And then there, there's other things. Hue, saturation, color, bright, uh, color, uh, brightness, and contrast. So, okay. So let's say I'm going to use this as my main background color. So I'm going to say background pound sign AA Zero, 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 zero. Now again, for those of you that followed the explanation of how that is done, the first two characters represent the amount of red. AA is actually a pretty high number, so that's why it's a pretty bright red. All right? And then I can say color. 
I will make the color white. And that's the color of the text. The hex code for white would be pound sign FF, FF, FF. So we're going to start out just doing this. All right, we'll come back and we'll add things to our CSS file. But we'll start out with just this. So I've created my CSS file. I'm going to save it on the desktop. And I'm going to call it style.css. All right. Now I have to go into my HTML file and point from my HTML file to my CSS file. That code is going to appear in the head section. All right. This is the second thing that we've talked about that goes in the head section. So I will say link. Now this is different than the A hyperlink that you click on and go to another page. This is simply saying, hey, bring in this file, bring in the CSS file. Type equals text slash CSS. Rel equals style sheet. href equals style.css. So now this page is linked to that style sheet. So I can link all the pages on my site to the same style sheet and all of them will get the same appearance. So let me go and save that. And over here, click refresh. And there we go. That's how my page looks. Questions about this so far? The point I'm trying to make is I'm doing this incrementally. I'm not developing my entire HTML stuff and then going back and um, adding CSS at the very end. I'm, develop I'm doing a little piece of it in HTML, a little piece in CSS, a little more in HTML, a little more in CSS, and so on. Yes? Exactly. In fact, let's go and do that. Let's say I'm going to make these H1s be black. All right? So, I could say H1 color black. So now how are H1s going to look? The text will be black. What will the background be? We have a vote for white. Do we have another vote for something else? It's still going to be red is our other vote. Let's see. So let's go and save it. Hit refresh. And the text is black, but the background is still red. Why is that? This is the cascading part of CSS. You think of a cascade like a waterfall. It trickles down. All right. So let's look at these two files, our HTML and our CSS. I've defined everything in the body gets this rule. Remember, with CSS you have a selector, and then you have the properties and their values. So I've defined that everything in the body gets this rule. The background is this shade of red, and the color of the text is white. All right. So everything on the page gets that. I then go around and create a second rule. And I say H1s, I want to have a color of black. Color meaning the color of the font. All right. So, for this piece of content, for this H1, let's just look at this H1 for now, two rules apply, right? This rule applies why? 
Because NH1 is part of the body. So it gets that rule too, right? Body, background, red, color, white is a rule for everything, every element within the body of this page. Well, that H1 is part of the body of the page. So that H1 gets that rule. The second rule, H1 color black, also applies to that H1. But notice what I did. This rule, I've only specified the, the color of the text. So, both of these rules apply. This one sets the background color to red and the color of the text to white. This one comes in and overrules part of this rule. The part that it doesn't overrule cascades down. All right? So, everything in the body is going to have a red background. Everything in the body is going to have a text color of white. Except for H1s, for H1s, the co color of the text is going to be black. Notice we did not change the background color for that element. Because we didn't change that, and because the H1 is part of the body tag, the H1 gets the background color from the previous rule. So it sort of trickles down. All right? So you can have multiple rules that apply to the same element on the page. Well, which rule wins? The rule that's more specific wins. The rule that's closer to the actual element wins. So, for example, here I put a background color and a text on the body. So, yes, that applies to everything in the body. But that H1 rule that I apply, well, that's sort of closer to this content than the body is. So that rule is going to, the second rule, is going to take precedence over the first rule for those attributes, for those properties that they're in common. Yes? Is this what It's related to inheritance, yes. In this case, the order would not matter. Are there cases where the order matters? Yes. Later on in uh, the class, um, we're going to study doing some things with mobile spreadsheets. Or uh, mobile spreadsheets, mobile style sheets. Whereas we can have a different style sheet apply to a mobile device than for a desktop version of the site. So we can have one web page that looks one way on a mobile device, looks a different way on a desktop machine. When you get into that sort of thing, the order does matter. All right? But in this specific case, the sequence doesn't matter. I can switch those. What matters is the specificity of the rule. In other words, the H1 rule is more specific than the body rule. So that one's closer to this element. All right? The H1 is wrapped right around that text, so it's right there. The body is up here somewhere. So because it's closer, because it's more specific, that's what determines what takes precedence. However, if I don't define a rule for the H1 in this case, then whatever is put on the other rule that applies will still occur. All right. Now this is a powerful thing. And this is where um, taking the time to do a little bit of thought and figuring out how you want to do this will make for better style sheets. What does it mean when I say better? Almost always when we talk about software development or web development and programming, when I say better, it means easier to maintain. All right. So by giving a little bit of thought beforehand, um, it, it, it makes it easier to maintain. And let me give you a for instance. I could do this. All right. I simply copy the background color from the body to the H1. 
and save this. Page doesn't look any different than it did before, right? When will it look different? Well, what if I want to make this a brighter red still? I now have two places to make that change. And again, if I had more elements, I might have more stuff to change. If instead I don't define it on that level, I only have one place to change it. All right. This is one of those things that, you know, I can explain to you the principles, but it's worthwhile for you to play with it and learn it. All right. And, and you'll see as you work on this and experiment and try stuff, um, you, you'll, you'll get a better sense of why you do things certain ways and if you do it this way versus that way, what difference does it make and so on. Questions about this? Now, a logical question that you might have is, what if I wanted to make these two H1s look different? How do I do that? And I don't think we talked about this last time. All right? What we can actually do is we can actually define a selector that applies to tags within other tags. In other words, I say body gets this rule. That means, well, there's only one body tag on a page, so everything in the body gets this rule. H1, I then say color black. The way this is written, every single H1 gets the color of black. Alright? Now, I can get a little more clever in my style rule. And I'm going to try this. My selector is a little more complicated now, right? Remember, the selector is the first part of the CSS rule. It tells you what gets that rule. My selector originally was simply body, H1. That means every body tag, which there's only one of course, but H1, every H1. By saying article H1, what do you suppose that means? It's being specific to the H1s that are within article tags. So in other words, if we look at this code, this, this H1 will not get the new rule that I added because this H1 is not part of an article. This H1 is part of an article and therefore will get this rule. Here's what I want you to think about for a second. These are my rules. The body has a background of red and a color of white. The H1 has a color of black, and article H1 has a background of white. When I go and view this page in the browser, what is this going to look like, and what is this going to look like? What is this H1 going to look like? What's going to be the background color of it? Red. All right, we've already done that one, and nothing we've done now is going to change that. So it's going to stay red. What's the color of the text going to be? Black. What about this H1? What's the background going to be? White. What's the color of the text going to be? It's going to be black. All right. Why black? Well, this particular text here, this June 23rd H1 tag, this within this article, all three of these style rules apply to it, right? It is in the body, so that style rule applies to it. It is an H1, so that style, uh, style rule apply, applies to it. It is an H1 within an article tag, so that style rule applies to it. So, thinking in terms of cascading down, all right, this rule would make it if this were the only rule, this H1 
would have a background color of red and a, color, a text color of white. If these two were the only rules, this would have a background color of red and a text color of black. When I add this rule in, this is going to have a background color of white and a text color of black. So all three of these rules apply, but the more specific one, the more specific ones take precedence over those um, attributes. All right. So in other words, this element's going to get its text color from this one. I'm sorry, it's going to get its background from this one, and it's going to get its text color from that one. So I can get anything from this one, the way it's written now. All right. So I go and save this. I go and save this. And sure enough, it's as I described. That is the cascading part of the cascading style sheets. All three rule all three of these rules apply to that H1. And the browser starts painting that element by applying the first rule that applies, the most general rule that applies, the most specific rule that the more specific rule that applies, and finally the most specific rule that applies. Now if I do something like this, font family. Then, actually, all three of these rules are going to contribute to the way it looks. It's going to get the font family from the bodies rule. It's going to get the color of the text from the H1 rule. And it's going to get the color of the background from the article H1 rule. Let me make sure I save it. Let me tell you, that's definitely one of the most common stumbling points for people, and even myself when I do web development, is I'll make a change and forget to save the file. Then when I go to view it in the browser, my change doesn't have any impact. So if you make a change and your page doesn't look like it changed, make sure you've saved it. So now I look at this, and now notice, again, all three of those rules apply to this element. The one that takes precedence is the most specific. So I get the background color because of the article H1 rule. I get the text color because of the H1 rule. And I get the font because of the body rule. Questions about this? Yes. Okay. So, like your question is like to translate between different languages? Yeah, that, I mean, that typically would be done through some sort of server-side scripting mechanism. So, in other words, what it would do is um, it would go and it would... Um, take, you know, take the text, run it through some program or script and produce a translated result. That would not be done via CSS or anything that we've covered here in class. So when we're dealing, if we're dealing with any other language and when we're writing, then we don't need to really deal with the Ah. You don't need to worry about your book. you don't need to worry about that. Correct. Keep in mind you, you mentioned that the book says to specify the English or Spanish or whatever. That's a way of providing additional information 
about the page and that helps with search engines. All right. So for example, if I go and Google something, if I do a search on I do a search for football. If I do a search for football. I'm going to see these pages. All right. If I go to advanced search and I can say identify, only give me the football results that are in French. All right. Notice I get a whole different set of pages. Providing that information that your page is in French or your page is in English or whatever will help that search pluck out your um, page and understand what language it's in. All right. The translating though, like here, this actually runs it through a Google service and translates it from French to English. Yes. Yeah, that's done via uh, scripting that's run on Google. Google takes your page, runs a program on it, figures out somehow the English or the French equivalent for the English words that you're saying and, and displays them. Or the other way around. Because we're in French, yeah, it figures out the English words for the French words on the page and, and does that. So if I click translate here, Notice again, it's a different kind of football. I, I deliberately picked football for that reason. But notice that it is a little bit awkward. Information flows for a while. If you see the original French, and I'm going to disappoint my high school French teacher here by not being able to tell you what that actually says, but um, the Google service shows you what it said in the original French. Notice also, and this is a good, good point, good time as any to bring it out. Not all the words on this page get translated, right? Where are some words that don't get translated? These words didn't get translated. Paris combiné du jour. That didn't get translated to English. All right? Why not? Why do you think that? It's not text. What is it? It is an image that contains words. So in other words, Google's going on its merry way looking for all the words as part of this, this page. It sees that as an image. Yeah, Google doesn't know what that's an image of. It could be an image of a soccer ball. could be an image of a dog. could be an image of anything. As it turns out, it's an image that contains text. So Google's like, oh, that's an image. I don't need to translate images. All right. And then it doesn't translate the words. For that reason, don't put images in words. Uh, don't put words in images. Right. 
create the, 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 the text should be a block of text, should be a paragraph or whatever, then things like Google Translate can translate it for you. In addition, if a screen reader, someone was blind and was accessing this, it would not translate it, and it would not read the text on that. Forget about translation for now, because that's not text, it's an image. And again, the screen reader wouldn't know what it's an image of. And therefore, by putting text in images, you're sort of defeating the purpose of that. Now, the alt attribute could allow you to put something in there that, that might mitigate that something. Let me give you an example of when you might want to put text in an image. Coca-Cola. Very famous logo, right? Done a very certain style of print and all that. There's no font, there's no Coca-Cola font to make it look like that, right? It's just an image. Well, they need that on their page, right? That's their brand. They want everyone to know this is a Coca-Cola site. So, okay, use text for that, but put an alt attribute in that says Coca-Cola logo. So people that can't view the image know um, what's being displayed. Yes? Exactly. What that is, is this is, and this is a good eye. You can almost like, by looking at this and reasoning through, you can almost sort of reverse engineering. This is happy birthday. All right? That is translated, right? That is in English. That text is not part of that image. That text is overlaid on top of. This is the image. The text is like sitting on top of it. Like, a, like, like if I were to, to, to put a, 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 a drawing up in PowerPoint and then draw over top of it or whatever. And I can more or less prove that to you by going here, right mouse, and saying, open image in a new tab. The image is just that. And that text then sits on top of that. And therefore, it gets translated because it's a block of text and not, um, not part of that image. Whereas this guy over here, if I write mouse and say, oh, worse yet, that's flash. All right? So that's even worse than I thought. Let's, now, that's also flash. Yeah, these are, yeah, these are just ads. I was looking for one. Here we go. Open image in new tab. Yeah. That text, that image consists of text. But it's in English. Why is that? Well, the original was also in English. Maybe. I don't know. I think so. Anyhow, questions about this? So if I go and show the original, Joyeux Anniversaire. All right. So it, it does go back to French because, again, that's a block of text. No, actually less than that. You identify your page as being in French, all right, or, or Spanish or whatever language it's in, all right? And that's an attribute on the HTML tag, I think, right? Lang equal language or lang, lang equals English, whatever. Your browser is smart. Your browser looks at that. It knows your default language is English. It sees that this page is in French. It asks you on the top, do you want to translate? So you don't even have to call the server-side script. You just identify your page. Hey, this page is in French. All right? The browser then looks at it and says, well, this guy normally doesn't speak French. This guy is uh, default language is English. All right? To find somewhere under your preferences in Google. Um, let's see if I can find it.
language and settings. Yeah, right there. Here the browser knows that I speak English. Comes across this web page. That. I'm going to scroll down somewhere here. This Don't be intimidated. This is a giant web page. Oh, that's a translate page. That's a translate source I'm looking at. Okay, again, that's somewhere on here. If we were to look at the page without translating it, I know what I can do. I can bring it up in Internet Explorer. Actually, I can just bring it up here. Pardon me? Ah, right here. Thank you. Lang equals FR. All right. So, the Chrome browser is smart enough to see that there's a disconnect. I said my language is English. This page says it's in French. So, it's smart enough to ask me, do you want to translate it? So, your job as a web developer, remember, is to describe your content as accurately as possible. If you do that, then these wonderful features of the browser can kick in for you, and it happens for absolutely free. Yes? No, there, there is not. In other words, if you look at these tags, the script tag is a script tag, all right? Yeah, HTML, the, the language of HTML is English-based. Now, to be sure, a lot of the HTML is done with codes, like UL for unordered list, an abbreviation. But again, like section is section, all right? So yes, the language HTML is sort of English-based. Um, it would be like if you were writing um, um, Java code, for example. The if statement in Java is if, the English word for if, not the German word for if. And there is no like German Java that where you'd use the German word for if instead of the American word or the English word. Question. Little detour on the way, but hey, I like I like the detours. The one thing we did learn from that, though, is don't put text in images. All right? Use text for text. Yes? Would there be any reason that you would have to identify your page as English? It would be beneficial if you expected uh, an international audience. Because their default for Chrome, if you're in, or, or you know, if you're in France, for example, their default language is going to say French. You know, if you look at their default settings, if you look for their Chrome settings, say their language is French. So it would do the opposite. If we identified it as English, then it would know to kick in and, and do that. All right. So yeah, it would be beneficial to identify it as English. Describe the content as accurately as you can. So actually, I'm being a little lazy, and I should practice what I pe preach. And near as I know, there's not a British English option that like throws extra U's in words randomly. Oh, there is? OK. Inter all right, interesting. I guess so. I guess there is one then.
Repeat that, please. You still found your HTML was black. Yes. In other words, when you put an attribute, remember, this is an attribute on the tag. It's extra information. I have an HTML document, and oh, by the way, the language it's in is English. You only put the attribute on the start tag. You don't put the attribute on the end tag. All right. Let's see. Let me look at my to-do list. All right, let's do text formatting. There's a chapter in the book, I forget which chapter it is, but it covers text formatting. W3Schools actually also has a good um, little section on text formatting. So learn HTML. Format it. And these are some of the things that you can do. All right, on here. You can make text bold. You can strongly emphasize. You can emphasize. So, for example, here. Say, I want to emphasize the word right. You know, my voice doesn't sound right. All right. I could put an EM tag around that. That's saying I'm emphasizing that word. All right, if I look at the HTML of it, notice the word right is in italics. All right? That is the default for emphasized. If I want to indicate I was not just tired, I was so tired, I could emphasize it. But somehow emphasize it doesn't emphasize enough how tired I was when I woke up this morning. So I'm going to say I was so tired. I strongly want to emphasize it. All right. I will do that with a strong attribute. Mm-hmm. Oh, very good. Yes, we can. So, for example, let's view this. And I'm going to... And we can see it, right? And we can see it well enough. My voice doesn't sound right. That's in italics. I was so tired when I woke up. That's bold. That's the defaults of the browser. Remember, your page looks the way it does by a combination of two things. Number one is the default behavior of a browser. By default, your browser make H1 tag, makes H1 tags big. 
By default, your, your browser makes links blue and underlined. By default, if you use an unordered list, for each list item, there's going to be a bullet point. By default, if you say something is emphasized, it's going to be in italics. If I say something is strongly emphasized, it's going to be bold. Now, CSS allows us to change those defaults to be anything we want to. So, what would be a different way that I could emphasize that visually? I could underline it. I'm going to avoid underlining it, and we'll, we'll talk about why in a second. What's another way? Make it a different color. What's another way? Make it bigger. Let's make it a different color and, and make it bigger. The reason I'm not going to underline it is oftentimes underlined text is thought to be a link. So, in other words, if I were to underline it, that might give the idea that if you click on it, you'll see a picture of me first thing in the morning or something like that. And God knows we don't want to give that impression. All right? So, I'm going to change it by, I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to remove the expectation that it's a link by not putting an underline here. So, how would I make this so this would be, say, blue and bigger? Well, I do it via style rule. And I could say strong. I want to be blue. And I want my font size to be 2M. So, what does 2M mean? It means two times the emphasis, two times the font size. So, if I say 2M, those words are going to be twice as big as the other words. And the background color, is, or, and the color of the text is going to be blue. What's the background color? Still going to be red, right? Because it's going to get that attribute from the other style rules. So, now I go and do that. And I was so tired when I woke up. All right. Likewise, I can do that with M's. Just a plain emphasis. Color. So it's a little bit bigger and it's black. And it's still italics. Yes. I have a question. That's all right. Yes. What you can typically do is, let's look at W3 schools. If you do a view source, you can see their web page. All right. Here's an example of one of the style sheets they use. Typically, you can click on it, and there you see it. If that doesn't work, you can simply add that on to the end of their URL. Like that. And see it the same way. So, yep. And it's funny, I've had students ask me, um, like, how can I keep people from seeing my code? I came up with some real clever JavaScript or CSS, or, or even how can I keep people from being able to save images on my page? All right. I, I had a student for a project want to do like a daycare center, and they didn't want people to like, be able to download and save the images. And uh, the answer is, is you can't. All right. You can make it harder for people to do it, but in a nutshell, it's going to get sent to, it gets sent, the, the page gets sent from the browser, or I'm sorry, from the web server to the browser. So those files come to your machine. So there's no way that you can prevent that code from being accessed by people in the C or CSS. 
There's no way you can absolutely prevent it. You can, there's a few tricks you can do to make it harder, but again, you can't prevent it. All right. So that's two examples of text formatting. Let's look for some more. We talked last time about subscripts and superscripts. If you wanted to put H2O, you could use the sub to drop that down a little bit so that the two is b below the line. Okay, if I do H2O like that, it's just going to appear. like that. If I make that a subscript, it'll look more proper like in a chemistry book. Let's drop down that below there. And you can do the same thing with superscript, like if you're doing a Pythagorean theorem, a squared plus b squared equals c squared. You can use instead of sub for sub, you can use sup for superscript. And that will put it above there. There's the ability to do inserted and deleted. Deleted puts a strike through through it by default, but you could go and change that any way that you wanted to. All right. Why would you want to tag deleted text? In other words, let's say I plan to go on a picnic later, but it rained and I canceled out. Sometimes it's funny. Okay. I am going to go on a picnic. So I, I say that on my page. I'm going to go on a picnic. There we go. If I delete it, by default, how's it going to show? Pardon me? With the strike through, All right. I am going to go on a picnic with the strike through on there. And I have absolutely seen that as um, um, you know, used for comic effect, you know. I had to go to a meeting today which is a fate worse than death and you put a strike through in there like maybe I better not say that out loud or something like that and you can do it for comic effect. When might you use that other than for comic effect? When might you use it seriously? When you have a list, things that I need to get done, you know, um, you could do that to indicate that it was completed, that you wanted to delete it. What else could you use it? Okay, exactly. Uh, like things with rough drafts or things where a document changes. What I'm thinking of is things where an official document changes. Let's say, for example, a company changes their vacation rules. All right, and maybe originally you get your you earn your vacation after you're there for a year, and they change it to you earn your vacation after you're there for six months. All right. Now, they could just go and change the text on their policy page, but then it would say, you earn your vacation after six months. And someone visiting that page would look and say, what do you mean? They made me wait a year to get my vacation. What's going on here? Let's get the torches and storm the boss's office, the whole, the whole thing like that, right? If you show that it was deleted and changed, then you can give people an idea. Hey, it used to be this, 
but now it's this. So anytime you see like policies and procedures, a lot of times they'll do something like that. They'll indicate stuff that got deleted just, and the, they don't want to delete the text, but they want to somehow indicate that this is no longer relevant. So in the case of here, I'm going to go on a picnic. I could leave that in there to show that I plan to go on a picnic, but that didn't happen. And the strike through sort of indicates that. The flip side of that is I have an inserted. One nice thing, by the way, of the W3 schools is, is they allow you to go in and see their code examples. And in this case, inserted stuff gets underlined by default. Of course, you can change the browser default. So having inserts underlined I don't think is a good idea because that's what would confuse people to think it's a link. So I would choose maybe a different way of highlighting it. Now, let's say I, oh go ahead. Make your words in blue, that's a good point too because blue is, blue is, is typically the color of links. So yeah, that's true. And especially, don't make it blue and underlined. All right? And I'll tell you, and I please, I hope they haven't changed their page. I, I, I have sort of in my head uh, an accumulation of bad web examples. And every now and then, apparently people get the clue and they change them. And then it burns me up because I can never show it. But I'm hoping that they haven't changed this one. WRUW, cases station. Oh my god, they changed it. Thank you. Archive.org. Oh, I like how you guys think. The Wayback Machine. What this does, this archives the web. So you want to see what an old page looks like? You can go back and you can see where it changed. Let's go back to 2013. And here's a snapshot of the site from 2013. Aha, here we go. Thank you so much. Click more below for a complete Northeast Ohio Jazz calendar. You don't know how many times, how many hours I spent sitting there. The link ain't working, all right, because that's blue and underlined. They want me actually to click this, not click that. That's horrible. That's tricking the user into thinking that that's a link. And I don't think they did it maliciously, but it's a bad design. And again, they don't do that in their, their new page. They, they, pardon me? Exactly. Exactly. Th thanks for the reminder. That, that, that's excellent. That's, uh, I'll have to remember that in the case of people getting wise and, and getting rid of their web development problems for that. All right. So what did we look at? We looked at answering, deleting, strongly emphasized, emphasized, superscript, subscript, Here's a good one. Quotations and citations. You can use <laughs> you, can, you can use the Q tag to indicate that something's a quote if it's a short quote. All right. The WWF's goal, and that is, in case there's a confusion, the World Wildlife Federation, to build a future where people live in harmony. All right, so you can put a quote in there, and without manually putting the quotes in, it puts the quotes in for you. Now, 
We can go and we can do that another way, right? We could make quotes a little bit bigger to stand out or put them in a different color. Let's make... Again, I can go and edit their code and test it to see what it does. So this is a nice little learning tool. So I could say Q... color red. And there it gets, pardon me? The whole, the whole quote, yeah, from beginning to end. Yep, otherwise it's just the quote marks. For longer quotes you have the block quote. So for example, you know, like a single sentence you would indicate with a, with a Q tag. If you were quoting a whole paragraph from some place, you would put in a block quote. Now notice that you have a citation in there that's kind of like giving a footnote. Now, I'm going to see, oh I'm in Chrome. I cannot see the citation, but at the very least, it's in the code. All right, so I'm not passing this off as my own. ABBR allows you to define an abbreviation. And if you like mouse over it, a little bubble pops up explaining the full abbreviation. Pardon me? That's no, that's not the citation, that's the abbreviation. I did not see the citation pop up when I moused over it, which I was a little surprised. Maybe I, maybe I just wasn't hovering in the right place or something. Address for contact information. Site for work title. By default, it's in italics, but you can change that via your CSS. A BDO for bidirectional override. I have no clue what that means. Actually, I do think I know what it means, but reads it backwards. Why, why would you ever do that? Some languages are, yeah, languages are oriented in the opposite direction. Uh, yeah, or, or for humorous effect, or if you, know, you wanted to you know, play around. Th that's an answer for almost any question I ask, like, why would you want to do that? Because it's, like, it's funny. You know? Why would you put white text on a ba white background? Because it's funny. You know? But... Um, yeah, the more legit reason for this is there are languages that go in the opposite direction. So you might want to um, orient that um, that way. Let's see, next chapter. I'll skip through these. Comments, we talked about those. All right. Your textbook, I think, has a couple other ones um, in there. Um, like you can put a caption on an image um, and so on. So read through um, that chapter on text formatting. And it's, it's, it's good that we talked about the language example today because that illustrated the benefits that you get the more accurately you describe your web page. So if I describe my web page as being in English, if, a, if someone whose browser is set up for another language visits my web page, they'll get the offer to translate it. All right. If I just assume, well, gee, everyone in the world speaks English, so I don't need to put that in, 
then I've diminished the functionality of like the Google Chrome browser and so on. If I have an abbreviation, if I put the abbreviation tag in there and explain it, I give additional information that the user can hover over it and see, hey, WHO means World Health Organization, and so on. So the more accurately you can tag your code, the more information you can provide the browser for it, which means that the browser has some built-in capabilities that might come in handy, and you have the advantage of doing things stylistically for it. For example, the strong emphasis. By default, it'll make it bold, but if you want to strongly emphasize that by making it gigantic type, you can go ahead and do that as well. All right? So read through that in the book, and we'll do that. Using images for backgrounds. I did want to hit that today. All right? So... Let's wish that fellow a happy birthday on our own web page. All right. So I'm going to go and I'm going to write mouse on here and I'm going to save the image as that. Now notice that I have file extensions turned on. So, it shows that the file extension for this is .jpg. It could be .jpeg or whatever. So let's go to my page. I must have missed that. So I'm going to put this guy's image in here. I'm going to rename it to HB for happy birthday. Now, I'm going to actually put this image on the page two different ways, all right, just to show you some things that we can do. So I'm going to say, caption underneath it. Ah. You're right. So this is one way that we've put uh, an image on our page via the image tag.
there's the image, there's my fig caption, and so on. Another thing I can do with an image is I can make an image a background for something. A background for an element on the page. So, let's go and let's find There we go. I'm going to say save image as. I could actually make this the background image of the article. All right, That's actually what they did on that French page where they had, that's probably what they did, I don't know that for sure, but where they had the soccer player's picture and they had the text on top of it. So I could actually use this as a background image for my article. So how do you do that? I can change that to say, no, I still want to keep that. I could say article background instead of putting a color in I can put a URL in. People think the word URL means like web page which it does but actually stands for universal resource locator. It's essentially saying where a file lives or what the file's name is. So, file's name is cold.jpg. Everything's in the same folder, so I'm just going to say cold.jpg. And now when I go and view this, I get that as my background image. Now, a couple problems here, right? Number one is that I don't see the whole image. I see part of the image. Number two is that I see like half the image duplicated, right? I see the top half here, the top half here. What if I wanted to make it so that my text appeared right over top that image. All right, I could set the height and the width of the article. That would be one way to do that. And I'm going to do that so that it matches the image. So I'm going to look to see how big this image is. This is 500 by 405. So I could go in here. For good measure, I'll make it. I'll make the height of the article 600 by 600. Height 500 pixel. Width, and I meant that to be 600 pixel. All right. So now I save this and I view it. 
and well, moving in the right direction, right? I made it a little too tall, and I got that little bit extra here, and I have a little bit extra here, but at least I'm seeing the whole picture. And I could probably figure out a way to, to make that a little tighter. Let's do that for today. Let's make the height 430, and let's make the width 550. All right, so there we go. We have that little bit extra here and that little bit extra on the bottom, but we'll leave that for today and we'll clean that up next time. I always like to do my classes like, like a TV show. Like, I don't know if you guys ever remember the show Alias. That was like a great, it was like a spy show. And like with Alias, it was always like the last two minutes of it was a cliffhanger. So like it looked like you know, the building was going to explode or the plane was going to crash or the villain was going to shoot the good guy or something, right? And it always looked like, hey, there's no way out. But yet, when you look next week in the TV guide, Alias was still there, so you know the person escaped and so on, but you still want to tune in to figure out how, all right? So I like to leave a little cliffhanger. So this is today's cliffhanger. And I know you might, might keep you up tonight worrying about how this is going to happen, but I'll take that risk. We'll answer Thursday how I can get rid of that little extra stuff here and that little extra stuff here. The one thing that does bother me, though, is now that I put an image background here, I can't read this text, right? Because it's white text on a very light background. So I will fix that. And how do you suppose I can fix it? Well, change it to some other color than, than white. So for that article, I could put a color of black, let's say. Now, I'm still in better shape, but I still got some problems, right? Because, like, yeah, these words I can read fine, but, like, the words that are underneath or over top of his hair where the hair is dark brown and the text is black, I can't read that. We'll talk a little bit next time on how we could fix that and how we could make it better. That's one of the drawbacks with using images as backgrounds, is that if you're not careful, you're going to interfere with the text. So the good news is, is hey, this makes it look, look, look kind of cool. It's cute. At a glance, I know that, hey, maybe this person doesn't feel well today if they have a, a little graphic like that. All right, so it's not just cutesy window dressing, it's actually adding the impact to it. It does show, by the way, the fact that I put a cartoon there, that I'm not really seriously sick, right? Because if, you know, if I was in the hospital with pneumonia or something, I probably wouldn't put a silly little cartoon there, all right? Or if I had a serious injury. But this shows that, hey, today I'm, I'm a little down uh, under the weather. And it shows at that at a glance. So this actually does add value to it. Unfortunately, it blocks the text. So we'll deal with strategies on how to fix that next time, and also strategy how to get rid of these little duplication parts of it, given the fact that the text area for this article is bigger than the image. Questions? All righty, we'll see you in lab. Yes? Uh -huh. It's more flexibility. Um, it has more flexibility. And, and um, I, I do have to say that that's something that... I, I don't remember the specifics about like what it gives you, but it does give you more capabilities. Let's, let's look at that. ASCII versus UTF-8. What's the advantage of choosing ASCII encoding? All characters ASCII. UT UTF has a UTF-8 has an added benefit of character support beyond ASCII characters. Oh, yeah, you probably should. Yeah. Um, the web pages we've done so far are simply just letters 
and stuff. So we can, you know, it's okay that we just use that because ASCII characters are fine. Yep. I do think that th there's probably a more, more, um, a better, longer uh, explanation in the text, at least at some point. Maybe we have, maybe we haven't hit that page part yet. All right. See you, Lamb.